Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Dark Matter Knits podcast. I'm Elizabeth Green Musselman. It's April 11th, 2014, and this is episode seven. The theme for today is to the moon and back. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, a couple of things mainly. I always throw in a few extra little bits, but the, the main focus for today are going to be a couple of things. Uh, one of them is uh, kind of the, the literal meaning of to the moon and back. I um, got a review kit about a week ago of a really sweet sock pattern um, called to the moon and back, and I wanted to talk about it with you because I thought it was a really good example of how to do one of these kits right. And it's an excellent pattern. Um, I'm really enjoying knitting it. So I want to talk a little bit about, not just really about the kit, but about what makes it a good kit. And um, and then I want to talk about, I don't, I'm not sure I'll do it in this order, but yeah, I will. I want to talk a little bit about my career change. I've had a couple of people ask me to talk about this. And I know a lot of people think about making a transition from a, uh, you know, say a more traditional career into the fiber arts. And so I wanted to talk about what that's been like for me over the last couple of years. I've, I'm fairly new to that transition. And, um, and I want to be really frank about, you know, what's been, what's been good and bad about that transition. Sorry, my glasses are really, <laughs> really messy. Oh, hi, there you are. So, um, and then I'll have a technique video for you at the end as well that uh, that actually, again, another listener or another viewer asked me to, to do. And I really appreciate that kind of, of feedback. A number of you have been requesting segments or technique videos, which is which is really nice. I like I like hearing from you. Uh, just a couple of pieces of of business before we get started on that. Uh, one of them is that I want to, again, thank people for. Uh, helping me get the word out about the podcast. There are a number of you who have done some really nice things over the last couple of weeks to do that. And I particularly want to single out Paula from the Knitting Pipeline podcast. Uh, the, what you said about my podcast on your last episode was really nice. And um, and a, lo a lot of people have come over to my podcast because of your recommendation. Um in fact, Paula's podcast, if you've not listened to it before, The Knitting Pipeline was one of the inspirations for this one. I would definitely recommend that you that you give it a listen if you haven't before, if you like what I've been doing here. Paula is um, extremely smart and you know her her style is Im improvisational, somewhat like mine, but she's also clearly planned out what she wants to talk about and has some really interesting uh, nature notes and you know just uh, well-considered thoughts on on knitting and design. Uh, there have also been a few of you who have left additional reviews and ratings on on iTunes, and um, and I really appreciate that as well. Uh, particularly out in the woods and MCJ Mom One, thank you for for posting reviews. If you've done posted reviews on iTunes in other countries, I thank you as well. It's a little harder for me to check those. It's not impossible, but it's very time consuming for me to look to see if anybody's done that. Uh, but thank you for for helping me get the word out. I um, I also want to thank a number of you have helped me to do some test knitting for a shawl that I'll be releasing shortly. I just need to take the photographs and uh, the tech editor is looking at the pattern now. The test knitters for this project have been very patient. <laughs> or they've been impatient and they haven't told me. <laughs> I don't know what happened with me with this pattern. Um, I have to assure you, if you've never knit one of my patterns before, that normally I uh, I get the numbers pretty well settled before before I send it out into the world, even in draft form. And for some reason, I was just botching it left and right with this pattern. So a number of people had to kind of back up and move forward. So thank you very much for for sticking with me through that. I really appreciate it. And I'll I'll show you soon what that looks like. In fact, I can kind of give you a. Oh, you can't see anything. Um, oh, well. But there's a... Uh, well, here. I'll go grab it. So it looks like this. It's very simple knitting. It's a fingering weight shawl. It's about uh, five feet long. It's actually a little longer than that, the way I knit it, or the way I blocked it. Um, very simple lace at the edging. It's knit side to side. 
and then the edging, the stitches are all picked up at the end and uh, and knit from there. But what I really like, this is the whole reason I wanted to do this shawl in the first place, was I found these pendant beads on Etsy. Very inexpensive. Uh, you can actually find them in, in craft stores too, I believe. And I just thought it would be fun to use those on the edging of a shawl. Um, in fact, what I really want to do is re-knit this at some point with... Uh, you know, maybe a gray or silver, maybe even sparkly yarn. So do this in gray, do this in a really dark charcoal gray, and then get some um, some black beads to put on the edge, uh, just for, you know, kind of a less casual look. But you can wear it, you know, scarf-like, or you can... Um, it's long enough that you can... I mean, I'm five foot ten, so... You know, this is not going to be one of those things that you constantly have to be <laughs> hiking onto your shoulders, but you can wear it more like, like a shawl, but it's not very deep. It's only about, it's less than, less than a foot deep. So I'll just keep this on for now. So, um, yeah, so let's, let's talk about, uh, what I've been working on because that will lead into talking about to the moon and back. I just have one other thing I want to show you. I've been working on a, on a hat design um, to go along with uh, re releasing Cooperative Press, that I, which I do book design for, is releasing a series of young adult novels about a teenage boy who uh, has some weird, has a weird blood disorder that uh, means he can only, or a, a, a strange disease that means he can only consume blood. He can't eat regular food. And um, so the whole the whole sort of funny thing about the book is that he has kind of all the symptoms of being a vampire, but he doesn't actually seem to be one, or is he? It's it's a little unclear exactly what's going on there. But um, so the book actually has nothing to do with knitting. But I thought that since Cooperative Press is largely a craft publisher, that it would be nice to have a knitting pattern that was kind of tied in with the books. So I'm designing a hat for Jacob Marisbeth, who's the, the main character. He's a 16 year old boy. Um, I have a friend who has a, a son who's 15, so I'm going to have him model it as soon as it's done. I'm knitting it out of that. If you're, if you have a very good memory, you may recall that I bought this yarn at DFW Fiberfest not too long ago. It's this stuff from Lilani Arts. It's that uh, really soft, it looks really rugged and tweedy, but it's actually a merino wool, so it's actually quite soft. Uh, and I really like, it took me, I struggled a bit, I mean this kind of ties in with the whole design theme that I wanted to talk about for today. Um, I, I struggled a lot actually with finding something that would work with this yarn because it's, as you can see, it's got enough texture and, you know, the tweed causes enough variation in color that, um, and it's very, it's quite thick, it's an Aran weight yarn, that any kind of subtle texture is just lost. Uh, I tried doing a knit and purl pattern and that just kind of disappeared into the, into the recesses of the color and the tweed. Um, I tried doing a more subtle cable pattern and that also just kind of disappeared. So, uh, what I found was that you really have to do, with, with a yarn like this, you really have to do a really bold pattern in order for it to stand out at all. So it's a, a large cable. It, it's over 14 stitches altogether. So that's going well, and I think I'm probably going to finish that today, and I'll be photographing it next week on, uh, on Thomas. Um, <laughs> it'll be really fun. I've never photographed a 15-year-old boy in knitwear before. How do you suppose that's going to go? <laughs> I actually kind of want him to look like a disaffected youth, so it, it may go fine. Uh, the other thing that I've been working on, and this is the, the review kit that I was sent, is uh, the To the Moon and Back pattern, and I'm realizing that I may be misstating the title of this pattern. It is, oh, it's sorry, it, it, I am. It's the Over the Moon kit. 
So this is a, a kit that is uh, released by uh, Little Skein and the Big Wool. And it's basically an a, a amalgamation of several different Indies products. So uh, the design is done by Megan Williams. Um, and the design is actually called To the Moon and Back. So the kit is called Over the Moon from Little Skein and the Big Wool. The, the, the design, the pattern that comes with it, which is for a pair of socks, is called To the Moon and Back, and I'll talk about that in a moment. The yarn comes from Mustache Yarns. I did her logo. See the birdie? And actually I did the yarn labels too. <laughs> I like that one. And the yarn is really pretty. I'll show it to you in a moment, but I kind of want to just give you the overview here. Uh, and the the bag, which is this very sweet and very nicely made project bag, just the right size for a pair of socks, has a very sweet, let's see if I can, well, unfortunately my window tends to kind of wash things out that are very light, but there's a very sweet little uh, moon pattern on the inside. It looks like polka dots from uh, because it's getting washed out but um, those are little moon faces on there and then also in the kit is I can fish it out at least it's not crinkling <laughs> are these very sweet little stitch markers that come in a, a tin with bunnies on it that says I love you to the moon and back this is all based on guess how much I love you which is a very sweet board book that I used to read to my son when he was little. And inside the tin are some very nice stitch markers. This one, you know, is probably like a beginning of the round marker. It's got a little bunny jumping over the moon. And there's one other large one that has a little, little clippy on it. And this one, it's two hearts intertwined. This one is, is called, you can either use it as a stitch marker or as a cable minder. And I think the idea here is that uh, for the cables in the sock, you can, instead of having a cable needle, you can just use this to hold a stitch to the front or to the back because the cables are not very big. They just involve taking one stitch and moving it forward or backward. So you could certainly use this to do that. Um, I've been, if you've watched a previous episode, I've been doing the... Um, the, the cables all without a cable needle, so I haven't been using those, but but it's nice to have them. Um, and then there are these little, you know, kind of these sweet standard little uh, stitch markers in there as well. I think there are about seven or eight of them, I suppose. A really nice, really nicely done kit. And uh, and Anne Valley, who is the the main person behind Little Skein and the Big Wool, really does a nice job of of packaging all of this up. There's a a sheet that explains everything that's in the kit. Oh, and it comes with a box of Smarties. Those are gone. Those were gone in like 15 minutes. <laughs> um, so yeah, she explains what's in the bag, uh, how to download the pattern. Um, she even put the pattern into both a file that has the photos and a file that doesn't have the photos so that you can print out the pattern without having to use up a lot of colored ink. Uh, she really, and I know of other, other podcasters have mentioned this before, she really puts a lot of attention into the details of, of these uh, kits that she puts together. And I should say in full disclosure, I actually tech edited this, tech edited this pattern, designed the logo for Little skein in the big wool and for mustache yarns, <laughs> so I'm a little I'm a little involved with these people um, whom I like very much, but the reason I work with them is because I think they do really good work, and um, and what I wanted to say about I wanted to talk a little bit about the the other materials in the kit as well. This is. Um, this is the yarn. Actually, you have a choice of two different yarns. There is um, this color, which is a semi-solid, again, done by Mustache Yarns, and it, you can see it has sparkle in it. Uh, it's showing up much more vibrant than it is in, in actual life. It's much, it's a pur more purpley and more subdued 
color than is showing up here. I really like this color and it's knitting up very nicely. And then there's a variegated, uh, or actually I believe it might be self-striping yarn that is comes in a kind of a sweet pink and white kind of cream and brown that calls upon the, the colors in the book. The, the base, at least for the, um, at least for this color, is Ritz Sock, which is uh, a merino nylon razzle dazzle blend. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> I have no idea what razzle dazzle is. I don't know if that's Angelina or if it's actually like capital R razzle, capital D dazzle. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, you know, kind of a typical sock blend, 75 merino, 20 nylon, and it's just got this extra 5% razzle dazzle and it's super wash so these are washable socks the pattern comes in multiple sizes in fact it uh i believe it starts at toddler and goes all the way up to um to adult large so it's really nicely done in that respect too because um you know, you really have the option of if your child is a, is a big fan of the book, you can make the socks for the child. If um, if you want matching socks, you could do child and adult socks. If these are, these socks are not particularly, these could go either way in terms of being, um, you know, kind of more, let me make sure I'm not giving any, ooh, yeah, I don't want to show that picture. Um, men or women could wear them. So, and I'll show you the, the cabling on here. The really nice thing about this is it's got these, you know, very kind of small one over one or one over two cables. And then it does this really cool I don't know if this is going to really showing up well, but the cable actually, the cables actually expand here. And as they expand, they kind of link up with each other, chain like, and travel this way up the sock. And then there are instructions for the OMG heel, which is uh, one of Megan Williams's own heel constructions, or it is her own heel construction. And, um, and I just found both in tech editing and in beginning to knit this that the pattern is, is extremely clearly written. And in fact, uh, I know Anne did a lot of work to take Megan's very clear instructions and format them in such a way that the clarity is just enhanced. You know, so the the charts are very clearly labeled. Um, it's very clear when you're supposed to move from the instructions to the charts how much yarn you're going to need, um, when you're supposed to move from one section to the other. I mean, it's just, it's all the abbreviations are explained, all the cables are explained. There are links to videos to explain any techniques that might be unfamiliar. It's, it's just, again, great attention to detail. So I'm finding them really, even though this is a more complex sock than I typically like to knit, I'm really enjoying knitting this because the pro the end product is so is so pretty, and um, and because the instructions are so clear. I really don't, despite the fact that it involves relatively intricate cabling. I don't find that I have to think about it that hard because it's just a matter of you know following the row and checking off the box. So really, really pleased with that. And I'll, I'll as I go along. I you know I had just some time to work on it this week, but as I go along. I will, uh, I'll show you how the, the socks are, are progressing along. So again, that's the Over the Moon kit from Little Skein in the Big Wool. And I almost forgot. It's so funny, because I've heard people talk about me as organized. <laughs> how am I doing now? <laughs> almost forgot to show you that uh, Anne very kindly sent us a coupon code for for this kit. And um, so this is just, just for us. Oh, is that going to get all washed out? I'm afraid it is. Ah, there we go. That's a little better. So um, she gave us a 10% off coupon code. 
And the code that you use is happy knitter 10 all run together. So in order to use that, you go to littleskein.etsy.com and, um, and just choose which kind of kit you're interested in. I know, I know you can customize them depending on the yarn and whether you want the, the bag and all of that sort of thing. So definitely, definitely can recommend that. The other, the main thing that I wanted to talk about today, or the other thing I wanted to talk about today, and that is, uh, you know, kind of transitioning to a career in the fiber arts and what my experience with that has been. Um, and I was trying to think, you know, what actually ties these two things together. And I thought to the moon and back was kind of a sort of a nice tie in because, uh, you know, I really, I made the transition from being an academic to working as a freelancer in the fiber arts. I, I didn't make that transition lightly, as you might imagine. And, um, and I did it because even though there were huge risks involved, I just really strongly believe in that idea that, you know, you just, you just live once and you can't live your life working in a job that is making you miserable. Not that my job was making me miserable and I'll get to that in a moment, but, um, you know, you've just, I, I kept thinking about trying it and thinking about trying it. And really, you know, what, what am I going to get to be 60 and just keep thinking about trying it? I, I needed to do it. So, you know, I think that kind of ties in with the theme in the sense that um, I just, I needed to think big in terms of my career and really take some, some serious risks. And I have. Um, so let me back up a moment and I just mainly what I want to talk about is uh, just kind of tell you a little bit about the story of, of how I made that transition and then talk about some of the, um, the advantages and disadvantages or, you know, some of the, the things I've been happy about and the things I'm still struggling with because I want to be, I know a lot of people are thinking about doing this and I want to just be really clear that there are, there are some costs involved with doing this. So, uh, so let's talk about, so this, the basic story, I don't want to, you know, bore you with too many details, but the, the basic story is this, that I, um, I went to college in the late eighties, early nineties. I had kind of been doing some flip-flopping about what I wanted to do as a career for a while. I wanted to be a science journalist and, uh, and thought that, I hadn't really studied anything like that in college. Um, so I was just kind of looking for a way to study the sciences without actually going down the professional scientist track. And I took a class my senior year of college uh, that was a history of science class. And it was fascinating. And I just thought, you know, this might be a way for me to if I studied the history of science at the graduate level, to kind of study the sciences in a really broad way and write about them in a kind of culturally informed way um, without, you know, specifically having to become a geneticist or a particle physicist or whatever. So I went to college or went to grad school with that in mind, that that was what I was going to do and just kind of got absorbed. I mean, PhD programs are really about producing academics. That's really where they're expecting to send people. I mean, well, I should say PhD programs in the humanities are, are geared in that direction. So, um, so I kind of got sucked into the whole academic thing. And, um, and just, you know, I really liked teaching and I liked doing the research. I really enjoyed what I was working on. And I just thought, why not? You know, I, I, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try becoming a professor. And I did. I was very lucky. I got a, a really nice job right out of the gate. Um, in 1999, I suppose, I started teaching at Southwestern University, which is a, a liberal arts college that's here in the Austin area. And, um, and, and a really great place to work. It was, it's 1300 students. Um, I was one of six people in the history department. I loved my colleagues. 
well, I still do. I still know them. <laughs> They're just not my colleagues anymore. And, uh, anyway, I had great, I had great students and, but I just found that I, I worked there for, th for 13 years and I just found that over time, and especially after I had my son, which I think was a part of the, a big part of the change that I started to go through, I, I found that my passions were shifting and it wasn't that I really wanted to stay home exactly. I, I, have a hard time imagining myself as a stay-at-home mother. That's just not really, I need something else to do. I knew I would have to work at least part-time, but I was finding that being in my head all the time was not where I wanted to be anymore, that I really wanted to be working with my hands more. <laughs> Apparently I work with my hands all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Also, and I'm gonna be really honest here too, I think another part of it is that having had a child and, you know, at the, at the time, you know, at the time that I started thinking about changing careers was when my son was a baby and a toddler. Being at work all day long with college students, many of whom are wildly self-absorbed, and then coming home to a two-year-old who is legitimately self-absorbed, was exhausting. Frankly, some of my colleagues were wildly self-absorbed too. Um, yeah, I just, I, I found that I was so drained by it all and I was really starting to lose patience with college students. And honestly, I don't know that I would go back to that age group again. Um, if I do go back to full-time teaching at some point, I think I would probably work with somewhere between fourth and seventh grade instead. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I think I had a hard time with people that I thought really ought to be making the shift to being a, truly adults, acting like two-year-olds sometimes. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> so, yeah. So I made, I've started looking into, I mean, it really, this whole transition was probably about three or four years in the making, like seriously in the making. And I th and really the, the main hangups were, you know, do I really want to give this up? Because I had worked so hard to get to where I was. I mean, I had spent six years in graduate school, uh, 13 years at my job. And by the time I left, I was a full professor and I had been chair of my department. I mean, you know, I was, and, and once you leave academia, it's nearly impossible to get back in. So, you know, it was hard to, and, and also, you know, hello, full-time job and benefits, like all of that stuff. So it was really hard to, uh, to let that go. And at the same time, it wasn't entirely, it took me a while to figure out where I would be landing. And this is, this is one of the tricky parts. And this, here's where, you know, those of you who are thinking about this really need to consider this is that the, the what I finally ended up realizing was, you know, I kept trying to build up freelance work on the side while I was working my full-time job, like trying to lay out as much of a soft landing for myself as possible. Like, do, am I, do I know that I'm going to have enough work on the other side? Can I build up enough that I can be sure that when I leave, I will be able to earn enough of a living to, you know, for us to be okay? And what I found was I worked really hard at that and I was completely exhausted, you know, from working full time and doing all this part time stuff. What I found was I just didn't have enough time to establish that with certainty. So that's kind of one of the, it's not really an irony, but just one of the difficulties of trying to make the leap from full time to freelance is that you're probably not going to have enough time while you're working full-time to establish with certainty that on the other side there's going to be enough freelance work so that you'll be good. So that was scary. Uh, I ended up getting lucky and I and I do stress that you know a lot of this was luck that I happened about a year before I quit my job I met Shannon Oki who is the owner of Cooperative Press and 
you know, a, a well-established knitting designer in her own, her own right. Um, I met, I took a class with her on knitting design at my local yarn store. And, um, and the yarn store owner, because I was working at the store part-time, asked me if I could take her out for dinner because she couldn't that night. And so I ended up getting to talk to her for a while and told her I was planning to quit my job, which just ended up being a kind of right place at the right time moment because about a year later when I quit my job was right about the time that she needed to hire someone part-time to help her with work at Cooperative Press. So, um, and actually in an incredible coincidence moment, it was literally the day that I submitted my resignation letter that she called me to see if I could help her out part-time. <laughs> Because I think I could have been okay with, you know, just completely freelance work. But knowing that there was steady part-time work available whenever I needed it has been a huge, huge weight off my mind. I don't think I would be very good at strictly free ch chasing freelance. Because i got to tell you, that's another part of this that is uh, both the glorious and the difficult side of making this time kind of transition is that there aren't really that many full-time jobs and a lot of people want them. They're very competitive and, um, and there's, there's a considerable amount of freelance work, but the chasing never stops. Right. I mean, especially at the beginning, you've just got to keep, you never know where the next check is coming from. And, um, and I'm finding that that is really exhausting. Uh, I mean, I know it's tiring for everybody. I know people who do this and, uh, and everybody says, you know, that it's, it's tiring and scary. Uh, I had not realized how much the security of knowing where the next paycheck was coming from, how much I had been counting on that. Uh, my anxiety levels have ratcheted it up to uh, levels I have not felt since I was about 13. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have trouble sleeping. Thankfully, my husband has a full-time job, which is steady and reliable, and it pays well. So in that sense, you know, I'm okay. It's just, and I know not everybody is even in that position, so I feel very lucky there, but I still, I worry all the time all the time about money. Um, so that's, yeah, if you can, if you can read it off my face and off my, my tone of voice, I'm telling you, this is, this is a serious, serious matter. Um, it's hard to get paid well for this work. And this is another thing I wanted to, to stress is that you have to think about if you are going to go the freelance route, and if you are making this transition, most of you will be, because as I say, very few full-time jobs. Um, you have to think about how you get paid differently, and this is something it took me a while to realize. Uh, because if you think about, I mean, most freelance work is done by the hour, or even if you're charging on a project basis, you're probably in your head thinking about, okay, this is how many hours I'm going to spend on it, and this is how much I would want to make per hour, therefore project price is X. Um, you need to build in more money than you think into how much you should get paid. Because here's why. You are not going to get paid for all that time that you spend chasing the work, billing the work. Um, you're probably underestimating how much time it's going to take you because you have to communicate back and forth with the client and not just work on their project. Um, there's just a lot of time that you don't get compensated for. And so when you do get the chance to get paid, you need to build that in. I mean, it sort of gives me, it gave me some insight into why law firms bill the way they do. I mean, it's, I know it's exorbitant, but it's like, okay, I sort of get it now. You know, why those fees are so high because there's all of this work that isn't billable, right? Um, so, I mean, I would say, just as a kind of general rule of thumb, that you, do, you really want to be charging at least $25 an hour for work that you're doing, if it's skilled work. Uh, I just as, you know, again, as kind of benchmark. 
because you're going to find that anything less than that is just, you know, it's really not living, living wageable. Um, now that's freelance work, right? If it's, if it's part-time, that's a little bit different, but, um, so that's, that's one thing I will say, Another thing I want to say about all this is that, uh, an, a one, uh, one reason that many people leave full-time jobs and go into freelance careers, generally speaking, not just in fiber arts is because they want to be their own boss. And I will say that is, that's a huge benefit of all of this with some strings attached. So, I mean, my situation is somewhat unusual in that when I was working at Southwestern, I mean, academics have a huge amount of, um, of workplace freedom, if you like. There were times that I needed to be there, of course, for my classes and meetings and so on. And I was just, I was expected to be around, but, um, but you know, I didn't need to be, be coming up to the office during the summer. I didn't need to explain why I was coming in at, you know, 9.30 one day and, you know, 8.30 on another. I mean, it, and I didn't have to check with people. My, the way I organized my classes was my own business. You know, I had to turn in my syllabi for accreditation purposes, but nobody was, you know, pouring over them to make sure I was doing things properly. I had a lot of freedom in my, even in my previous job. So for me, that wasn't a huge benefit shifting over. Now, I do get to control my time even more in some sense now than I did before. Uh, I never even have to leave my house if I don't want to, really. I want to. <laughs> but um, so, you know, your your situation is likely different in that this would be a, a big benefit for you in, in shifting over. I will say, though, that uh, there are some limits to that in the sense that, um, you know, working for clients still you know, obviously put some constraints on you. Uh, you need to do stuff by their deadline. Um, you sometimes need to put up with a certain amount of disrespect from clients, which I haven't experienced very often. But, um, you know, it's, it's a different kind of relationship for me from when I was working at the university. I spent most of my time with students whom I expected to treat me with respect, right? I mean, they're young, quite a bit younger than me. Um, I'm their professor. <laughs> I have the grade book, you know, so there were, and then, you know, because I was a faculty member, I was just, you know, treated respectfully too, because that was kind of part of the way that academia is set up for better and worse. Um, so, you know, stepping into a, a work situation where people don't have to treat me like that. Mostly they do, but they don't have to was a bit of a eye opener for me. Uh, again, I hadn't realized how much I had counted on that status as a kind of, um, that it just, you know, it makes you feel good to have people treat you like you know what you're doing and just assuming that you're smart and assuming that you, are uh, professional and confident. And I've occasionally had people uh, assume the opposite with me now, and it really bugs me. <laughs> like I really kind of fly off the handle when that happens. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I mean, there are just all kinds of, of issues at stake. I mean, I will say I've, I've emphasized a lot of the kind of negative or, or double-edged aspects of this, I will say that it's, it's also just wonderful working in the fiber industry. Uh, the people who work in this industry are creative and for the most part, extremely kind and, um, and, and really doing interesting things. I mean, I think it's a great place for somebody who is entrepreneurial. You need to be able to come up with new ideas. Don't simply think about, you know, what are the existing channels for me to plug myself into? Those are, those are good. But, um, you know, the kind of typical stuff like knitting designer, dyer, tech editor, photographer, um, fiber animal, razor. I mean, there are lots of ways of, you know, kind of making your way in this world. 
Uh, but you also really want to be thinking about what is new that you can offer, where you can take the industry that it hasn't been yet. So, for example, uh, Heather Zapetti, who started Stitch Sprouts, thought about the fact that there really are is a lot of opportunity with so many new independent designers. There's a lot of opportunity for wholesale distribution of those independent designers' patterns to yarn stores. There's so many designers, yarn stores can't keep up with all of it. So having a wholesale distributor who kind of gathers a bunch of them together in one place where you can order all of their patterns at once is a brilliant idea. So, you know, think about what hasn't been done yet that taps into what I can offer. And if you can do that, you can start your making your way in a more entrepreneurial direction, then you're going to you're going to be fine. Um I think if you're just planning on finding an already worn track and following it out, you're probably going to struggle more. So it involves a lot of, you constantly got to be on your toes. Constantly. It's tiring. <laughs> think, it, think it through before you make the jump. Okay, so uh, I think that's probably enough about that for now. But if you have any specific questions that you know, maybe just pertain to you or that I haven't talked about. Uh, there's lots of stuff I haven't talked about. So um, please feel free to ask me. I mean, they're in the forums that uh, that we've got on Ravelry, and I realized I haven't even told you where all that stuff is today. Uh, but in the forum on Ravelry, the Dark Matter Knits fans forum, I always have a, uh, a thread for each episode. And um, so that would be a particularly good place to ask any questions or make any comments that you might have on this issue. Um, so we can always talk about this again if you've got other things, that you, other aspects of this that you'd like to discuss. So I think that's, oh my goodness, I have talked, talked your ear off. <laughs> I notice my episodes keep getting longer and longer. Uh, so I'm going to do a fairly quick technique video today that again is based on a, um, a viewer's request. And, uh, and otherwise, I will see you in a couple of weeks. Take care. Okay, everybody, let's take a look at how to join a cast on in the round uh, so that you don't get that funny little blip at the bottom. So I've, I've cast on a number of stitches using the long tail cast on. And let's say that the, the pattern told you to cast on, uh, let's say, 80 stitches. I'm just going to pretend this is 80. And um, what you can do, this is a very simple fix that, um, well, let me show you what happens if you don't do that. Uh, if you immediately just start, uh, you cast on those 80 stitches, and then you just immediately start knitting, what you find is there, there can be this funny little jog where it looks really obvious that you know, the two ends don't really match up. So probably the easiest fix for this is to actually cast on one extra stitch. So if it said to cast on 80, cast on 81. So I could add one more, one more stitch here. And then I'll just take Take that extra stitch, the one that I, you know, don't need, move it over to the left hand needle, and then just knit the extra stitch, the extra cast on stitch, together with the first stitch of the round. So I'm actually just going to knit those two stitches together. Oops. At least I think I'm going to. There we go. And it won't be as obvious until I knit a couple of stitches past here. But now let's take a look. You can see that once I get that end out of the way, there's a much smoother transition between 
the beginning and the end of the cast on. Now there's another way to do this. You can just back up a little bit here. I'll get rid of that extra cast on stitch that I did. Another way to do this is just to go ahead and you know not not cast on any extra stitches but just go ahead and start working in the round like normal and then at the end to come back down here and use this tail to join up the cast on and um, and really the best thing to do here is if you see if you're doing a long tail cast on see how each one of these cast on stitches kind of swoops over to the left all you really have to do is just mimic that same movement put the the tail onto a um, onto a tapestry needle and then just swing it over here so that you get the same that same look of swooping over and just tuck it in to the back so you can just tuck it into one of the stitches back here so that the yarn is sort of permanently pulled over like this and then you've just got a seamless seamless cast on all the way across. So those are a couple of ways to, to make the, the join on your cast on look a little smoother.